and we're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dome to Home this afternoon. We're going to wait just a couple of seconds for some people to refresh their browsers if they need to and get the stream going. Happy Friday. Hope everybody's having a great week. Ready for a weekend. Congrats to the class of 2020 who at CU, we all graduated this weekend. Yay. Pretty exciting. All right, so let's get rolling. So thank you for coming out for Dome to Home today. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a presenter here at FISC. I also have Parker here with us, our navigator. Say what's up, Parker. Hello, everybody. I'm Parker. I'm an astronomy student here at CU. Um, have not graduated, but I am a navigator here at FISC Planetarium. Cool. And Parker is going to be flying us around the universe a little bit later today. Everything that you see here on the dome on the right hand side, that's all being done live by Parker, like right now. So he's controlling everything as we go. So uh, we can boss him around a little bit and tell him where, where to send us. And just to note, these visuals are best viewed in full screen. So if you want to maximize your YouTube, you get the best view of everything. And we also have our friend Emily here. She's not on camera, but she's going to be monitoring the chat. In case you guys have any questions or comments you want to throw in there, she'll be able to relay those to us and hopefully we can answer some of your questions. I'll try to get to some as we go, but we also have dedicated time at the end for questions. So if you think of anything, throw it in that chat real quick. Or if you're watching the recording, go ahead and put it in the comments and we'll try to get back to you. All right, with that being said, let's go ahead and get into our topic today, our sun and other stars. This is one of my favorites to talk about, it's super cool. And like you can see here in the dome on the right, we've got our daytime sky. This is about what it looks like outside right now, yeah? So we've got one really big star in our sky and that's about all we're seeing. But let's get a better view of some more stars. Let's get rid of that one gigantic sun so we can see some of our nighttime stars. I'll let Parker fast forward through time. Now we're about 7.30, sun is setting, 9 o'clock, you can see the stars coming out, still a little bit of that glow. Yep, you're probably familiar with that orange glow that we get here around Boulder or if you're in Denver or anywhere near a city. We can't really get a good look at the stars in our sky because of all this light pollution, all of the lights from the cities and houses and cars and all of that you know, normal human stuff. We like to be able to see what's going on at night. So you don't get the best view of the sky. But here in the planetarium, we can get rid of all of that. So you can see all of the stars that you could possibly see. Like if you're out somewhere really dark over in the mountains, maybe around like Nederland or even farther out, you get to see a lot more stars. You also get to maybe see the Milky Way, which is super cool. So we have our nighttime sky here looks good. Now we can sit here on Earth and look at stars. That's pretty cool. But since we are in a planetarium, in sort of, uh, what do you say we leave the Earth entirely and go and look at some of these stars up close? Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right with you, Parker. Let's get out of here. Boom. So we have blasted off. There's our beautiful Earth right underneath us there. You can see the sun in the background and all those other little stars there. Now, one thing that I always like to point out when we're out in space like this is it gives you a really much better look than you get here on Earth. You can really tell that stars are all different. Like some are bigger and smaller, some are brighter or dimmer. But without the atmosphere in the way, when you get this really great look, you can tell that stars are different colors which is super cool. Now the color of a star tells us about its temperature. Parker's blowing up a couple of them for you here. You can see there, these are two stars that are actually in the constellation of Orion. The big giant red one that you see there is a star you may have heard of called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse was in the news a lot recently. They thought it might be nearing the end of its life and about to explode. It didn't, we're still waiting. <laughs> So we've got the big red star, Betelgeuse. It's what we call a red giant star because it's really big and really red. And astronomers are awesome at naming things. 
So we've got our red giant Betelgeuse there. And then just to the right of that, you'll see the smaller blue star. That's a star called Rigel. This is down in the constellation of Orion, kind of around his foot. Now in the term of stars, the like I said, the color tells us about its temperature, but it's the bluer one is actually the hotter star and the red stars are much cooler, cooler in terms of stars, but they're a lot cooler than the blue stars. So I always tell kids, you got to think of it less like the faucet in your bathroom and more like a fire or a flame. Like if you look at this candle picture here, where's the hottest, hottest part of that fire? It's way down in the bottom where it's really blue. The outsides are cooler where it's the reddish and the orangish out on the edges. And then yellow and white stars like our sun are right in the middle. And that's a thing that we'll come back to a couple of times. Our sun is very, very average. Now to give you guys kind of an example of how astronomers look at this catalog of stars in the sky, we have a diagram, we call it the HR diagram. It's like a chart and I won't bore you with, you know, graphics all day, but the basic idea is basically that there's the big hot blue stars up on the top left, the little cool red stars down on the bottom right. And then we've got our special category of red giants up in the top there as well. Now, just as an aside, this system of classifying stars by their color and their temperature was developed by a woman named Annie Jump Cannon way back at the beginning of the 20th century, before women were even allowed to be scientists professionally. Annie was hired by the gentleman that ran the Harvard Observatory to help him catalog these thousands of observations of stars that they had. And so she and a couple of her friends got together, they started going through all of these, and the system of classification that she came up with is the one that we still use today. And once her work was finally recognized, she was the first woman to ever get a graduate degree from Harvard. And I think that's pretty cool. But let's look at our diagram again, because I want you guys to see where is our sun on this diagram? I don't have my laser pointer, but it's right there in the middle. Very, very average. But that's actually really good for us. That means that by studying our sun, we're actually learning a lot about most of the stars in the universe. They're all gonna have really similar properties, similar lives, similar deaths, that sort of thing. Now we have a couple of really awesome ways that we can study the sun too. We don't just sit here and look at it from the ground because A, that's bad for you. Don't stare at the sun with your eyes. But what we usually do is look at the sun in different wavelengths. And that just means that we have telescopes that are capable of detecting different kinds of light, not just the light that we see with our eyes. And there's all kinds of light. You've probably heard of like infrared light, like heat vision, ultraviolet light. There's also X-rays and gamma rays. Radio waves are even a form of light. So we can use all of these to look at our sun, which is what Parker's put up here. I love this thing. So this is a picture of our sun. And each one of these colored slices that you see here is a different wavelength of light. So if you kind of pick one spot and watch the little pinwheel go around, you can see how we can see different features with different wavelengths of light, which I think is awesome. Especially if you look all the way kind of in the middle on the left, you'll see these kind of bright, they're bright patches in some and they're dark patches in the other, those are sunspots. You can kind of see them going around. Oh, let's make it spin one more time. You see right there, that's what we see with our eyes, that little black kind of moles on the sun. But when we look at it in other forms of light, especially high energy light, like x-rays, we see these huge magnetic storms and big jets and loops and filaments and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And we would have no idea if, that that was there if we didn't have this technique of looking at things in different wavelengths. So this is one of the most useful techniques that we have as astronomers. And we can use this not just with stars and suns, but with planets and moons and galaxies and whatever, anything. It's super cool. Now, another really cool thing that we have is a brand new spacecraft 
that's studying the sun called the Parker Solar Probe. Now, Parker just launched uh, about two years ago. It was the end of 2018, so a year and a half. And Parker's out there studying the sun and orbiting around, and he's already broken a couple records. First, it is the first space, is the, sorry, the closest any spacecraft has ever gotten to the sun. Here's a great picture of Parker. You can see he's got that big kind of cone in the front. <laughs> Not that Parker. <laughs> so he's got, yeah, that really big cone in the front that's made out of this very special ceramic that's got these crazy heat shields, really fancy technology. So it's gotten really close to the sun already and has managed to even send us back a picture from inside the atmosphere of the sun. This is craziness. It's gotten that close. I think Parker's going to pull that up for us. You can get a really good look at it. It's crazy. There we go. Is this the one? No, same picture. <laughs> there we go. That That's the one. Yeah, so it's so close to the sun that it can already see it into the upper atmosphere. And so that's what you're seeing here, these bright jets and things. It's actually material coming off of the sun. You can see there's little kind of black dots. Those are just artifacts on the camera. But that one really bright white dot kind of in the middle is the planet Mercury. Now, Mercury is not actually like inside the sun or the atmosphere of the sun. We're looking through it, and Mercury's kind of on the backside there. But it's a really, really cool picture. Now, Parker is also awesome because it is the fastest man-made object ever. On one of its last trips around the sun, it clocked in at over 200,000 miles an hour. He's hauling. So we're getting a lot of really amazing information from the sun up close and personal. There you can see the sort of trajectory that Parker is taking. He'll get in really close to the sun and then back out a little and get close and back out a little for safety reasons. You couldn't just live inside the atmosphere of the sun. That would be really, really difficult. But hopefully he'll be out there until I believe it's 2024, at least, that they're trying to keep Parker in orbit. So we should have a lot of amazing data coming from this spacecraft in the next couple of years. But we don't need to do all of this work from space. We can actually get really cool solar data from him on the ground as well. And we're doing that now with a brand new telescope. It just came online a few months ago. It's called the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. It's in Hawaii. It's named after a Hawaiian senator who was really uh, crucial in getting the telescope built and put together. So we also call it DKIST. That's kind of the short name for it. And DKIST, just like I said, just came online and has just sent us the most high definition close up view of the surface of the sun that we've ever had. So that's what this is here. These are the surface of the sun. It's sort of boiling almost. You can think of it kind of like a, a pot of water boiling on the stove, except much, much hotter. And so you can see these, we call them convection cells, these little blobs that are sort of coming and going. Except each one of these cells is about the size of Texas. So these are huge. I mean, the sun is really, really big. You can also see some bright patches right in the middle where it's extra bright. That's where the magnetic field is really, really strong. So this new telescope, plus the spacecraft, plus all of these different wavelengths that we can look at, this is a really exciting time to be a solar physicist. We were, were uh, learning new stuff all of the time. Now, Emily, I see there was a question about how much of the sun does that picture actually show? And I'm not positive off the top of my head, but let me get back to you at the end. Hold on. So that's our sun. That's what we see. But of course, our sun is not the only star in the sky. Obviously, we see all of these other ones. Now, one thing that stars are particularly known for, at least here on Earth, is for making constellations. You probably have seen some constellations before. You may have a favorite constellation. We can go ahead and turn on all the constellations here so you can see what they look like if you could see all of them in the sky, all outlined like that. And this is what it looks like from here on Earth. 
and you can see we're even getting farther away. But that's the fun thing about constellations that people don't think about is that it's really just a human construct. These aren't actually like structures in space. These are just things that people made up off the top of their heads or because of their culture or whatever. But it's all very earth centric. So what do you think happens as we get farther and farther and farther away from the earth? Take a look, watch these constellations and see what happens the farther we get away. So we gotta go pretty far. How far out are we, Parker? Uh, we are one, uh, just past one light year. There we go. Just past a light year. We are about 10 parsecs away. So yeah, you can see these constellations start to not actually look like anything at all. And so it's tricky. When you look at them here on Earth, you might think that the stars in a constellation are all actually sort of close together in space. But when you look at it from far away, you can tell that like all of the stars in the Big Dipper, say, are not actually anywhere near each other. They're hugely far away. In fact, one of the ones that goes really, really far out is one of the random stars that's in the Big Dipper. I will just keep on moving out a little ways. As we get further and further away from the Earth, you start to get a great view of our Milky Way galaxy. It also gives you a great reference of where we're located in the galaxy. You can see our Earth is still right in the middle of that little colored blob. So we're kind of about halfway out on one of those spiral arms and out in the suburbs of the galaxy. Well. It might be good to note that uh, this is not an actual image of our Milky Way. That is absolutely true. We actually don't really know what the Milky Way looks like, per se, because we've never been outside of it. I mean, the farthest we've sent a spacecraft is barely outside of our own solar system. So most of the pictures that we see of the Milky Way are kind of cobbled together from things that we can measure. Like we can't, I, I always tell people, it's kind of like if you had to draw a picture of your house, but you'd never been outside, like what kind of things would you do to make this happen? You could kind of walk around the floor plan and figure out where there's walls and how things are shaped. You could look outside and look at other houses to see what they kind of look like. And that's basically what we do when we're trying to figure out the shape or the look of our Milky Way. We can take measurements and see where there's denser parts and more, spread out parts, where there's lots of stars, where there's less stars. And then we can look at other galaxies around us, like the Andromeda galaxy, it's kind of like our sister galaxy, see what those look like and kind of piece things together that way. Beautiful. And we're going to talk about galaxies themselves a lot next week. That's our theme for next week. Here's a great picture of the Andromeda galaxy. It's our nearest galaxy as well. But nearest galaxies are really far apart. So it's about, I think it was two and a half million light years between us and Andromeda. So very, very far apart. Stars themselves are even very far apart. The closest star to us is uh, Proxima Centauri. It's about four and a half light years away. So the light from that star takes four and a half years to get to us. And that's traveling at the speed of light which is the fastest speed there is. There's nothing faster than light. That's lovely. Not as cool as when it's in the pull down, but. <laughs> but we do the best we can. Now we did have somebody asking questions about the life cycle of stars and we can run through that pretty quickly. So stars are like giant balls of gas and they're basically formed from even bigger clouds of gas, gas and dust and things like that. These clouds we call nebulae. Nebula is the Greek word for cloud. So it's basically just a cloud of gas and dust. But they're some of the prettiest things in the universe too. Let's show them some cool nebula pictures. Mm -hmm. Lots of stardust. Ooh, yeah, there's some great ones. 
So these are what we call planetary nebulas. These are what happens at the end of a small star's life. And these are not generally the ones that will make the stars themselves, but they do happen a lot in areas where there's a lot of star formation. We can also, if you see the one on the top, not the far right, but the one just to the left of it is a picture of the Crab Nebula. That's one of my favorites. It's very, very picturesque. And this is what we call a supernova. So if we kind of start from the end and work our way back around, supernovas happen when a really, really big star dies. So a big blue star like Rigel, when it gets to the end of its life, it's basically going to explode. And when it does that, it shoots off all of its material out into space. So these clouds, these nebula, are made of all of the gas and dust and particles that were inside or around that star when it blew up. So it's basically like star guts all over the place out in space. And so it makes these huge clouds. They're very pretty. They're fun to look at. But they're also not perfectly even. So there'll be little clumps of gas. It's either a little stronger over here or a little stronger over here. And eventually those clumps, as they start to get bigger, they get a little more gravity. And with more gravity, that means they can attract more stuff to them. And so they just keep growing and growing and growing in that way until eventually they get so big and so dense and have so much gravity that they're smushed all together and it's enough heat and pressure on the inside to start nuclear fusion. That's how a star gets its life. It's fusing, doing nuclear fusion on the inside, changing hydrogen into helium, smushing all those elements together until they combine and make bigger elements. And so that's kind of the fuel center of a star is this nuclear fusion. So once the star kicks on, it'll start burning through that fuel. Bigger stars burn through their, their fuel a lot faster because they're a lot hotter. Smaller stars, little red stars, are gonna last a lot longer because they're not as hot and so they don't burn through that fuel as fast. And like you see here, red, uh, yellowish stars like our sun are kind of in the middle. So they can do the nuclear fusion, but they don't do quite as much as the big stars. They have average lifetimes. I see a very popular question here from Everett and a few people I get all the time is, will our sun go supernova and how long do these explosions last? Excellent questions. Luckily, our sun is not big enough to explode in a supernova. It will still die. Our sun's about middle-aged, so it's been around for about 5 billion years. We think it's probably got another 5 billion or so to go. So not something we have to worry about in the immediate. The sun's not going to explode anytime soon, so we're good. But when it does, it is going to, instead of explode, it's more like a, like a poof. So it's still a pretty violent poof in, you know, human terms. But it'll kind of, when it starts to run out of energy, it loses the ability to hold itself together. And so it starts to swell and get bigger and get bigger. And so when our sun dies, it's gonna to start to swell up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's gonna actually end up coming all the way out almost to the orbit of earth, maybe even a little farther out, we don't know. But it's gonna swell up and get super big. And then rather than, yeah, a violent explosion, it'll just kind of poof off its outer layers and will kind of dissipate in cloud and make those a planetary nebula, kind of like we saw in those pictures earlier. See, look at that, boom. And all that material will sort of blast off into space. Very picturesque. And planetary nebula is kind of a strange name for something that would literally destroy all of the planets. So our sun, smallish, medium-sized stars will do this planetary nebula bit. Bigger stars will make the supernova. And either way, all of that material that gets shot off into space ends up coalescing back together to make the baby stars. So stars are like the great recyclers of the universe. All that material just keeps going and going and going, which is pretty amazing. As far as how long they last, the explosion itself doesn't last very long. 
it's basically a big chain reaction. So in astronomical terms, it's a pretty quick thing, but they're so big and so bright that they do stay visible for a really long time. There was a supernova that happened in the 1800s, I believe, don't quote me on that, but uh, it was visible during the daytime for weeks. So if a star like Betelgeuse does actually reach the end of its life and explode, we're gonna see it. And it's gonna be really big and bright in our sky for a really long time, which is exciting. That's pretty cool. Another excellent question. And I see we do have just about five minutes left. So I want to see if anybody has any other questions that we could address. Or if not, we can just look at more pretty nebula pictures. Beautiful. So here we see more of those planetary nebulas. You'll notice a lot of times they have more of a kind of circular shape to them because it's a much gentler poof. So the material doesn't get shot out quite as violently. It's more of just kind of dissipates on its own. So they have a lot of roundness to them a lot of times. Here's a full sky of the Crab Nebula that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So you can see this one looks a lot more violent. You also get different things left behind after a supernova or a planetary nebula. Small and medium-sized stars, they'll form those planetary nebulas and leave behind a white dwarf in the center, which is uh, basically the remains of the core of the star. And it's still really bright. It's not doing fusion anymore, but it's still very, very hot. So a white dwarf will last for a really long time too. It's very small and very dense. Supernovas, on the other hand, will do, uh, that's what forms bigger and more exciting things like neutron stars and black holes. Those are formed by the collapse and the destruction of really big stars. So really big stars will make neutron stars a lot of times and only the biggest, biggest stars will create the black holes when they die. Another good question, how many stars are in our galaxy and what kind are they? We have all kinds of stars in our galaxy. Big ones, little ones, old ones, young ones, you name it, it runs the gamut. How many of them are there? I'll quote my favorite person in the world, Carl Sagan, billions and billions of stars. So many stars. I'm not sure of the exact number off the top of my head, it's got to be up in the high billions, maybe even to the trillions. Um, and then, of course, there's billions of galaxies in our universe. So there's really an uncountable number of stars in existence out there. I see Penelope wants to know, is the sun going to turn into a white dwarf? Probably. Yeah, it's right about the right size that when it gets to the end of its life, it'll Turn in, it'll make one of those planetary nebulas and poof off its outer layers, and then we'll have a white dwarf left in the middle. Excellent question. Anybody else? All right. One last one here. So Ronell wants to know, what advice would you give for young women who are interested in planetary sciences? That is an excellent question, Ronell. I love talking about this. Um, probably one of the first things I would say is don't give up. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are really hard about astronomy and planetary science and astrophysics. It's not an easy thing to do, and that's why not a lot of people end up doing it. But keep at it. Be persistent. Don't give up. It's not impossible. Even if you're not, you know, the greatest at math, or maybe you have a really hard time with coding, it's not impossible. You just got to keep at it. I'm not good at math at all. So you just have to be persistent and know who to talk to. Don't be afraid to ask people, to ask questions. 
If you find somebody that you think is really cool, go up and ask them about it. If you see somebody and say, I really want to do what they're doing, go talk to them. Because I guarantee you, every scientist in the world, there's nothing we love more than to talk about science. So, and we're happy to give advice. We're happy to help out when we can, hook you up with other people. It's a really wonderful community of scientists. We're not all like big and snooty, like sometimes people think we are. We're super cool, <laughs> super chill. So yeah, keep at it, be persistent, do your homework, study a lot. It's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. I would highly recommend it. All right, and with that, we are right at 4.30, so we are out of time, but thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, like I said, be sure to tune in next week. We're gonna be talking about galaxies and all the cool things that they do. So we've got our uh, K through fifth grade show, Monday at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. We've got sixth through 12th grade on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. And then of course, we'll do another all ages show next Friday at four o'clock Mountain Time. Be sure to join us then, submit some questions ahead of time if you like, and we'll get to them during the show. Otherwise, thank you guys so much again from myself and Parker and Emily. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.